Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone, episode number 373 for the 13th of December 2015. Richard Saunders here with you from Sydney, Australia. Hmm, a cool, overcast sort of day in Sydney. A nice change, a nice change from the heat and humidity. Maybe I should set up the Skeptic Zone weather podcast. Maybe I should do that. Who was it that said, was it Oscar Wilde or Noel Coward said, everybody talks about the weather, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it? When there are some things we can do things about, coming up on the Skeptic Zone, here's how you can help some European-type people in Europe promote their new podcast, ESP. No, it's not about magic and clairvoyance, it's about scepticism. The new ESP podcast is a joint venture in Europe. And coming up at the top of the show, we interview Pontus, Andres and Yelana, who will tell you more. Yes, the new European Skeptics podcast, ESP. I love that. I love that. I, I think that's a wonderful name for a skeptical podcast. Find out more coming up soon. Following that, it's a little press release from Australian skeptics about a school in the state of Victoria here in New South Wales having a chicken pox outbreak. And this is one of these schools that have a, a somewhat tolerant attitude when it comes to people's choices, whether to vaccinate or not. And here's another old expression that chickens have come home to roost. Then it's a week in science from our friends at the Royal Institution of Australia, www.riaus.org.au. I'm sure that URL is now firmly imprinted in your brain, which it should be, because it's a fine institution and good scientific outreach. And then Maynard's spooky action. Maynard, at Skeptics in the Pub, just the other week, interviewed the uh, guest speaker from Brisbane, Ross Bouch, who you will recall is uh, involved with the Brisbane Skeptic Society. He's going to be talking about virology. That's right, those naughty viruses. And there are some good viruses too. In fact, viruses are sort of indifferent, really. They're sort of just living their life cycle. And to round off the show, evidence please with Joe Alabaster. Joe's going to be talking about a press release from the Australian Skeptics where they, we, because I'm, I'm involved with Australian Skeptics, uh, have issued a challenge to so-called psychics to put up or shut up when it comes to making predictions. Now, this time of the year, and it's probably the same wherever you're listening around the world, psychics end up on the TV, usually morning TV programs, in the news, on the radio, with their predictions for the following year. But what we've discovered over many years of following this is they're never brought back at the end of the year to be held to account. And by our calculations, reckonings, they're about 95% wrong. It's pathetic. It's cheap entertainment. Did I say it was pathetic? Anyway, press release with Joe Alabaster coming up to round off the show. But before we get started, this news has just come to my attention this morning as I uh, do an early record for the Skeptic Zone. Anti-vaccination supporters holding chicken pox parties. Unbelievable. This story comes from Rose Brennan, the Courier Mail, as reported at www.news.com.au. Queensland anti-vaxxers are offering to infect other children with chicken pox, a highly contagious disease. Look, I'll slip in a link to this story in the show notes. But that's... Uh, that's quite worrying, and the woman involved, one Holly Singleton, appears not to be concerned that chickenpox can be a fatal disease. In a secret forum called Vaccine Free Australia, she posted, My son has a full case of chickenpox. We are at home together for the week. If anyone wants to clear this bug now and get it over with, please come to Brisbane to visit us. We are here to infect only those who want it. 
with a little uh, colon and P sign, you know, the, the face with the tongue sticking out. Just appalling, and uh, I guess it shows that the anti-vaxxers are still having an effect. And here's the hint, people. Don't take kids to chicken pox parties. Just, you know, don't. <clears throat> But now it's time for me to run downstairs and have a couple of slices of good old peanut butter toast. Crunchy, of course, of course. While I'm doing that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Folks, do you wish that you had ESP? I've always wanted to have ESP. I don't think I can ever have ESP, but I can have the next best thing. It's a new podcast, relatively new podcast, called ESP. Is it about the psychic? Is it about mystics and clairvoyance? Or is it about something more down to earth? On the line now, covering some countries across Europe, I have some people involved with ESP. Let's find out some more as we discover this new podcast from Europe. Who have we got on the line and where are you from? We can start with uh, Sweden, I think. Hello, I'm Pontus Berkman. I am vice president of the Swedish Skeptic Society. I am uh, well active in the skeptical movement since four or five years back. And now we're involved in this ESP project. That's great. And your voice, of course, is well known to the Skeptic Zone, as is our next guest, uh, Andres. From, uh, you're in Brighton at the, at the moment, but you're normally from Hungary. Yes, that's that's correct. And uh, yeah, thanks to you. Um, this is my second time on the show. <laughs> um, and I really appreciate that. Um, yes, I'm originally from Hungary. I'm the vice president, one of the vice presidents of the Hungarian Skeptic Society. And uh, I've been a skeptic for almost 20 years now, uh, which sounds crazy, um, given the fact that I'm, I'm only turning 34 uh, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and um, yeah, I've been I've been running skeptics in a pub in um, in Hungary and uh, given talks there, and uh, got involved uh, in 2014 in uh, the Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia um, project. That is an international thing, and uh, that's how uh, we got to know each other with the, with the, with the guys we're running the show with. That's fantastic. And of course, our last guest is also in the UK at the moment. And I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting you. It's uh, Yolanda. Hello. Oh, hi. Yes. Hi, Richard. Um, I am uh, fairly new to the movement. Um, I've also been, um, well, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and um uh, I remember listening to the Skeptics Guide to the Universe where um, Susan Gerbic was on and she was talking about the guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia. So I've joined. And that's how I met uh, Andres. Um, and we kind of been to a few things together, a few conferences. Um, and um, recently Andres had came up with this brilliant idea to start a podcast. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of <laughs> finding my feet <laughs> so in the skepticism movement. Even though you're in London at the moment, where are you originally from? Um, I'm originally from Latvia. Right. Uh, that's a Baltic, Baltic state, I'd say the ex-Soviet Union sort of country. Um, yeah, uh, opposite Sweden. <laughs> opposite How Sweden. That's a good play. Yeah. That, that's a good way for people to know where Latvia is. I'm delighted to say that one of the members of the uh, Australian Skeptics here in Sydney is a is a person from Latvia. Her name is Signa Kane, although she's about to get married. She's going to be called Signa Dean. And uh, Signa, you I, you may have heard of her, but she does some good work here in Australia. So uh, Latvian skeptics have a good reputation. Mm, great, <laughs> not bad for a small country like that, like Latvia. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Not bad at all. Well, let me start with you, Andres, for, about uh, why this new podcast has started. Can you tell me a little bit about it and uh, how you go about putting it together, since it seems to be a big collaborative affair over Europe? 
Um, yeah, well, I've, I've been meaning to, to start a podcast of my own uh, for years uh, by now. And uh, originally I had the idea of, of starting one in Hungarian, but it um, turns out that, that in Hungary podcasting is not a big, big thing. At, well, I have to say it's not a thing at all. So people, people don't even know, uh, most of the people, what podcasting is. Um, but um, And of course, um, I, I heard the talk um, given by... Um, by um, uh, Tim Farley, who who told us not to start another podcast in English no, and another do blog, <laughs> and uh, don't do that. And um, yeah, I, I I took it to heart. Uh, but uh, then then I realized that what we really lack um, is is a kind of a European perspective on skepticism. And uh, you, Richard, have done a lot to tackle that problem. Um, and I, I, I have to uh, tell you that, that uh, we listeners of the, the Skeptic Zone appreciate that a lot. Thank um, you. Because, because you did something to, to, to cover events and happenings and, and, and developments um, in, in European countries as well. But, of course, you have a different focus on your show originally. So you can, you can dedicate a segment of the show to, to this outlook, but, but, but not really a whole show. And um, then I realized that uh, when you, we look around um, the, the circle of, of uh, skeptical podcasting, uh, we don't see anything that is dedicated particularly to European level skepticism. And um, this is how the idea turned, my, my idea of, of, of doing a Hungarian one turned into doing an international one. And uh, the, of course, the problem was that um, whom to do it with, because the people I knew were very much into podcasting and are experienced um, in, in the field, they have already been doing it. Thankfully, I met in 2014, it was in at QED in Manchester, where I met Jelena and also Pontus. Both of them I met thanks to Susan Gerbeck uh -huh. uh, through Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. Yeah, and we, we got on pretty well right from the, the start with, with both of them. And this was a great opportunity for us to, to, to get to know each other a bit more. And then at the Skeptics Congress, the European Skeptics Congress um, in London this September, I brought up the idea to them. They didn't oppose, so <laughs> no, here, here I, I we are. I thought it was a great idea because I had I had thought about you know played with the idea for for some time that I would like to do something. I was thinking a smaller scale. Maybe I should do something about what's happening in Sweden, but in English, so that others could follow that. It didn't happen, and it was just a, a, an idea. But this is a much better idea, I think. I think you're absolutely right, because uh, it would be wonderful to do stuff in, in the native language where you are and, and to talk to people in your own, your own language. It's always better, of course. You can always gather your thoughts better in that way. But I think that uh, certainly English is such a, such a, a, a widely spoken language. And if you want to reach the most people, reach the most people, of course, it's, it's sort of obvious in a way. I guess it shouldn't stop you doing other things in your own language for, for other reasons. But I think it's a very good idea to have this sort of international uh, approach to things. W what do you think, Ilana, about that? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, I thought it was an amazing opportunity to get out there and, um, you know, leave my mark. Um, and I was very excited when when Andres um, proposed the idea. I mean, there's so many um, great podcasts that we, we all listen to and aspire to be like. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and unfortunately, you know, like like Bob said, we we couldn't do it in our native languages because of the the you know the, the obvious reason you have to know at least 20 different languages. <laughs> um, but English is so international. I mean. Yeah. It's, you know, it's one of those things, um, especially the younger generation. I, I certainly can talk for, for Latvia and Russia and whatever. The guy, all, all the people there, sort of my age and younger speak English. And uh, it was a safe thing to do to, to start the podcast in English, to reach as many people as possible. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And uh, I guess I'm lucky that uh, English is my native language. So I've sort of, it, it's easy for me to certainly digest information in, in that respect. But also, 
I think because you're choosing to to do this in English, you have uh, the huge uh, potential audience of North America, which is always in the back of my mind. And hello, everybody listening in uh, North America and Canada, uh, who make up a huge percentage of my my audience. And it's good to get your message out to to anywhere in the world, really. Yes, and um, it, it it is really happening because uh, we are trying to um, to track our listeners geographically, of course. And it turns out that uh, most of the listeners are um, in the United States, and and that is part of of our so to say mission to give an idea because um, we experience that quite often that um, in North America, in the United States, and also in Canada. They sometimes don't even realize that there is a huge continent called Europe, <laughs> where there are lots and lots of countries yeah. with lots and lots of skeptical organizations doing their own stuff uh, in their I, own language. But also, I think in, in Europe, we are some of the countries in Europe are, are fairly small. So we are sitting fairly close to each other, but we don't know what's going on on the other side of the border because. You know, the, the Finnish guys, they do things in Finnish and in France, they do things in France and in French and, and, and you don't understand each other. So you don't know. And I think that's what we found when we be went to the QED and met a lot of international people and at the European Skeptics Congress. We met people from Czechia, from Portugal yeah. and say they're doing the same thing as we are doing. But we don't collaborate. We don't know about each other. Yeah, so no, we, we don't do something we, about that. And we don't share the experience, like, for example, with um, UK, we've got quite a few very uh, active groups, um, um, let's say people who uh, oppose homeopathy, and they're actually doing stuff on, on the, um, the level of, where, where they're trying to change legislation, um, and they're trying to, to change the laws, and they're trying to change the, all this kind of thing. Actually, homeopathy is a problem across the board, you know, across all the European countries and, you know other continents, Australia and America. And it'd be great to share that expertise. And But people are not aware because they don't know that, you know, the good thinking society is involved in a battle against homeopathy on, on, a, on a national health service, etc. So it's absolutely crucial that we, you know, pull ourselves together I mean, I know that Pontus said it's a, uh, sorry, Andrew said it's a huge part, you know. But Europe is quite small com compared to America. <laughs> it's no, it's tiny. not. Well, mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to say, Europe, Europe is exactly the same size as as um, America. Um, but um, even even if when you, when you yeah, we're talking about the United States, it's a bit, bit even even larger than that, uh, and has more inhabitants as well. Well, you should. Uh, get, you should there come, are seven. Seven. So you should co come to Australia next time. Come to Australia. We're we're quite a big continent too, you know. Not many people. Yeah, I know. I've been to Australia. Uh huh. <laughs> so have I. Yeah. 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 I, I uh, love Sydney. Yeah, we'd love to go back and see. How can people help? Where can they go? And what's the format of the show? And how often do you hope it uh, might come out? Maybe Pontus, you can cover that. So the show is a bi-weekly show, and uh, we want to cover news of skepticism and scientific news from across Europe. But we do rely or, on uh, listeners telling us about things going on, conferences or, or scientific news, uh, skeptic activism in the other countries. Um, right. If you want to get in touch, uh, then uh, please write to us. Our email address is info at theesp.eu or you can visit our website which is theesp.eu or you can find us on Facebook there is a, a group called the European Skeptics Podcast I think the only one on Facebook come and join our movement <laughs> All right. we are also available on Twitter you yep. can follow us on Twitter as well and uh, what we have on Facebook is a Facebook page uh, where uh, you can you can like us, you can find us, you can sign up for the um, podcast as well. So yes, folks, the uh, information there, the contact information is info i n f o at t h e e s p dot e u the e s p, or just head for their website, which is the t h e e s p 
dot eu. I think that's great that your web your uh, your uh, website and your podcast has got the uh, term ESP in the title. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a, we were very happy about that. I think it's uh, it's, it's a bit fun. I think I think it's fantastic. Yeah, good, good job, Andres. <laughs> yeah, it's not my job. It's a coincidence. It's, it's, it comes from the the actual name. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes me want to rename my show to the Clairvoyant Hour or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Good luck with that. Well, it was fantastic to talk with you all. Spread sort of halfway across Europe as you are. Congratulations on getting this going. I look forward to hearing more episodes coming out soon. There you are, folks. If you want to hear a new episode from Europe with a European perspective in English, the ESP, I think, is the podcast for you. Well, Pontus uh, and Yelana and Andres, all the way from Europe, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Are you a skeptic living somewhere in Europe or simply interested in what like-minded people are up to in countries around here? I have good news for you. There is a new podcast out there with the aim of helping you connect with all those European skeptics. The ESP, European Skeptics Podcast, a bi-weekly show coming out on the 18th of November on SoundCloud, iTunes and Stitcher. Come and visit our website, theesp.eu, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and help us keep the project genuinely international and interactive. Let us provide you with a real ESP experience. I don't know how you can believe As published on the Australian Skeptics website www.skeptics.com.au December 11, 2015 Chickenpox outbreak at Tolerant Victorian School As many as 25% of the children who attend a Brunswick school that calls for tolerance for vaccine dodgers have contracted chickenpox. According to a story in The Age newspaper, at least 80 of the 320 pupils at Brunswick North West Primary in Melbourne's North have become ill with the disease in the past fortnight. It is understood the illness spread through Grade 6 before making its way to the lower levels to Grade 2, the report says. In the May edition of the school's newsletter, the principal, Trevor Bowen, said that 73.2% of students were immunised, compared with 92% within the local postcode. The Department of Health was first notified about the chickenpox cases on November the 26th. A department spokesman told The Age that, quote, There are no firm figures on the number of students who have contracted the illness since then, but we've been advised that over the period there has been an absence rate of 25% on any given day, end quote. The school says it respects, quote, the rights of every family to make choices about immunization, end quote. Currently, no school in Victoria can bar a child who is not vaccinated from enrolling. The state's government's no jab, no play laws come into effect on January 1st next year but they do not apply to primary or high schools. Under the policy, preschoolers who are not vaccinated will be banned from attending childcare or kindergarten. A previous newsletter aiming to take the heat out of the conflict said that there were many areas of school life where a range of opinions were accommodated. Vaccination rates across the state of Victoria have plateaued at about 90% for a number of years, something Health Minister Jill Hennessy wants to address. Quote, we're significantly concerned about the myth makers who go out encouraging people not to immunize their children, end quote, she told the age. Quote, get advice from your doctor, not from some quack 
who is opposed to vaccination based on dodgy science, end quote. Welcome to A Week in Science from RIOZ, bringing you the science you need to know. 2015 has been another big year for science. Here are our top five discoveries for the year, and unsurprisingly, one topic does tend to dominate. At number five, we have what is also the most controversial scientific achievement of the year the first genetically modified human embryo. Chinese researchers reported that they had altered mutant DNA that causes the rare life-threatening human disease beta thalassemia. The embryos used were non-viable, but the researchers reported other sections of DNA which had been unpredictably altered as well. If we're going to explore and colonise space, then food supply is a major question. And that's what makes number four so exciting. The first food grown and eaten in space. Lettuce was grown and subsequently eaten on the International Space Station for the first time. This development has overcome the challenges of growing plants in microgravity with limited water and artificial light. The Ebola outbreak, which hit the headlines in 2014, brought to light the problem of treating this and other epidemics. This year, however, we took a large step forward with the development of several candidate vaccines against Ebola. One of those vaccines, called VSV EBOV, has been shown to be 100% effective in human trials. We return to space for number two, with the NASA New Horizons mission, which has shown us more about the outer reaches of our solar system than ever before. New Horizons sent back the most detailed information about Pluto and its moon, and now continues on to the Kuiper Belt at the fringe of our solar system. Who knows what it's going to find next? And our top story for 2015? Water on Mars. This game-changing discovery suggests that water may exist on Mars right now, with evidence of water recently flowing down slopes. That's our top five stories for 2015. There's more information on the RIOS website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter at RIOS and like us on Facebook. I'm Paul Willis, and we'll catch you next week and throughout 2016. Here's Maynard's spooky action at a distance. Outside, the traffic is bustling around in Sydney as people run around and they go, I'm enjoying a bit of cool weather. But inside the Crown Hotel, where, of course, it's sceptics in the pub here for December, a big December is on the card for everyone, especially for Ross. Hi, Ross, who is visiting us from Queensland. Yes, this is my very first time at a Sydney sceptics in the pub, which is, uh, I'm really pleased to be here, actually. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think. What's the reputation of Sydney sceptics in a pub? Is it a rough and tumble, biffo kind of thing? You're expecting to leave here with a bruise? Well, I think it's a slightly different vibe to the backpackers that I've been staying at. I'll, I'll put, probably put it that way. But um, oh, yeah, no, oh, you really hurt your tailbone there, let me tell you. <laughs> you know what, I, I think Sydney Skeptics in the Pub is, is probably one of the more famous, though, isn't it? Because, you know, you, you think about the Skeptics in the Pubs in the world that you've heard of, and I think the Liverpool Skeptics yeah, are up there, yeah. of course. It gets mentioned a lot in Skeptics with a K. And, of course, the Sydney Skeptics in the Pub gets a it's lot of... because of Mike Hall's twerking. <laughs> Probably somebody, although the very image of that just sends shivers through my spine. Um, but of course, you know, um, Richard talks and you, of course, through the skeptic zone are talking about this a lot. And I think a lot of skeptics in, in this, if, you know, if they find themselves in this part of the world for a skeptics in the pub 
they should definitely come along. It's one of the premier events, I think, isn't it? Yeah, and you're here. And what are you going to be talking about to us tonight? Yeah, so I, I've been lucky enough to be able to talk to you guys today, and I'm going to be talking about emerging viruses. So essentially, viruses that have jumped to animals to us and caused us all sorts of bother, and, and how that happens, essentially, which is a topic close to my own heart as a virologist myself. Yeah, look, I'm going to jump in there immediately. As a virologist, you're part of the, the, the virologist in the industry complex, are you? <laughs> I suppose if, if such a thing exists, I would be part of it, yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, are there any that have been man-made and released by the military? No, that, that's certainly no. not happened, unfortunately. It's, it, it's every, um, it, it, every sort of episode of, of a big TV series or a movie would love to have you think that this is possible. Uh, Dustin, it, Dustin Hoffman in Outbreak. Have you seen a monkey? That's a great show. All you need to know is, that, have you seen a monkey? And you've got Outbreak down. Look, Outbreak is a great film, so yeah. let, let's not be yeah, too... Let, dis- yeah, let's, let's not poo-poo not, it. Yeah, let's not disparage Outbreak. It, yeah. it is an amazing film. But, I mean, the, the problem is with creating viruses is that we barely understand the viruses that exist now without creating our own to sort of go out and do damage. Like We've got things like Ebola, which are obviously devastating, some flu strains, and we haven't been able to turn those into weapons, let alone create something of our own. It just it seems so unlikely to me. Okay. And, and so how do they mutate and emerge? Where does this normally go on? Does it normally go on in animals that are close to man, like, like uh, avian or stuff, or with birds and with swine, and then it comes to us? Is that how it works? And we just hang out with them, we get it, it gets us. Yeah, pretty much. So every, obviously humans, we have our own viruses like measles and polio, and they're really exclusive to us. But a lot of other viruses are normally in, in say, bats or birds, as you've said, pigs. Uh, and essentially what's happening is as human civilization has expanded, we've been encroaching other species territory more and more. And occasionally, you know, the, 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 the right mutation happens where the virus will jump from an animal to a human. And often this doesn't cause us too much trouble because viruses don't do so well in humans if they're made for animals. But just occasionally they, they do go pretty well, like some of the flu strains that have been going around. But uh, obviously Ebola is one that comes to mind recently, having oh, yeah. killed so many people over in West Africa. But of course, other, other sort of zoonoses, and that, that's what we call viruses that go from animals to humans, um, they've actually been with us for thousands of years now. So I'll be talking about dengue today. That was originally a, a monkey virus, but somehow it, it jumped into mosquitoes and then from mosquitoes to us. But should I fear bat pee or poo in Australia? You know, one of the interesting things is is that bats are really crappy at transmitting their viruses to humans. What about when they wee or poo on me and flying over me? It's, it, it's funny. There's no real cases. I mean, Hendra virus is another good one, right? Mm. I mean, there's no cases of bats actually giving a virus to humans. Normally, the bats have to give the virus to another animal. Maybe it's a horse. Uh, with MERS, it's camels um, or, or any other sort of species. And then those species, which we have a much closer proximity to, maybe because of husbandry or, or something, like that, then then they pass the viruses on to us. So I'm, I mean, I, I've got to admit, if I if I woke up with a bat in my bedroom, I would probably get myself tested um, <laughs> because. One of the weird things about bats is they can bite you, and well, you, that's you don't. When you have those late nights drinking at the bat club. Well, exactly. I mean, or if you come across Batman. Yeah, that's true. You know, there's probably, I mean, I, I can't imagine his voice is that husky on, by accident. Well, look, what, what a question sceptics have never been able to answer is uh, uh, Claudia Schiffer and, uh, and that guy she was with. What was the go with that? He, he just ain't that good looking. And what? David Copperfield. And David, yeah, Claudia Schiffer, David Copperfield. That cannot be explained by any sceptic. Well, obviously it's magic. <laughs> and so what are you going to be pushing to really scare the Bahuti out of us as we go home virus-wise? Um, look, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave a, a bit of a mystery to, to the ones that I'm going to talk about, I guess, because I have a bit of a competition where I have a picture of the virus and I'm going to see if anyone can name the virus just on the picture, which... I reckon I can pick a... Hen- I can pick a... Well, what are some of those really well-known well ones? N- n- not Hendra, the one that was in people before that. Because there, there's one that's got a specific shape. I know it. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of viruses are quite distinctive. Flu is, is, is quite distinctive, some oh, say. I wouldn't know that one. And obviously those, um, those classic sort of vi- uh, images of a virus that you get in your brain are the bacteriophars, which have that kind of pod and then the, the weird sort of feet at the bottom. And that's, uh, but I won't be talking about those because they, of course, infect bacteria and not humans. Okay. And, and do you think uh, we will ever be able to have... There's a couple of viruses we've got. I mean, we've got stuff for herpes, I believe. The, but I think it slows it down. It doesn't kill it. Have we, have we got one that actually is a really good antiviral? So antiviral drugs are actually not very effective uh, a lot of the time because by the time you actually get the drugs, you've already got 
way too much of the virus. Um, so, I, as you say, it's normally symptomatic relief at that point. Um, I actually do think we're coming towards a time where a lot of these hard-to-treat viruses will have vaccines because we're moving away from the classic idea of a vaccine where you, say, take pieces of a virus or you kill the virus and inject it. And we're now moving to things like, say, DNA vaccines. And what DNA vaccines do is they, they basically produce constantly proteins from the virus and the immune system gets so much priming that you actually actually can completely eliminate a lot of these viruses. But, of course, the key is always to not get infected in the first place or get the vaccine ahead of time. So Mm. So, so how nervous should I be on the bus going home when there's a guy at the back going... Look, you know, the common cold um, is pretty nasty to to a lot of people, so I I wouldn't be too happy about it myself. Um, Obviously, the... The old adage is, if you're sick, you should stay at home, you know, but uh, people have lives, unfortunately, and they have to go to jobs, so um, the best you can do is just hope that your immune system's at its peak at the moment, and... Now, is there any chance we can get something ever like they have on Star Trek, whenever they come back from away missions and stuff and that, they get bathed in a light, a bit like ultraviolet, and they're, and they're disinfected? Would that be that great in real life? Because you'd be killing lots of viruses on your skin you might want. I would say that if, 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 if a light like that existed that was strong enough to kill the viruses inside your body, um, <laughs> having a virus would be the least of your worries after going through that light. It would be pretty traumatic. I think instant skin burn would be the, <laughs> would be the phrase to show Look, Ross Blatt, thanks for coming here to Skeptics in the Pub. And just tell us, what sort of career path does a virologist have in Australia? Do, I, I imagine you could have a career with Big Pharma, or what else would you do? Uh, uh, would you have to go overseas? What's the best idea for someone in your field? Yeah, so Australia actually, luckily, has quite a lot of... Uh, really cool virology stuff happening so you might have heard of animal house down at geelong um that's that big uh we call it bcl4 facility uh, and that that's where the nastiest of pathogens can actually be studied so hendra's being studied there ebola was being studied there all those kinds of things and that's obviously fascinating but of course we have all sorts of things like we're interested in a lot of arboviruses like dengue ross river because we have a lot of those and really no matter what path you want to take you can do it in australia you can work for a pharma company you can work for a university or you can work in sort of other industries as well uh, and of course there's, there's so much virology there's the immunology point of view there's the point of view of sort of looking for vaccines or just learning how they work to sort of help everyone else do their job so uh, i would say that anyone who's interested in virology could definitely get a good career and ross how hard is it like you've worked through a couple of disciplines like compared to maybe theoretical physics or something like that where does virology sit on the difficultness in the difficulty of exam scale I definitely think the math is a lot harder in theoretical physics, but of course uh, a lot of theoretical physics, they, they have the luxury of not having to strictly prove a lot of the theories, whereas I, I do, oh, of yeah. course. Mm, yeah, mm. yeah, bloody Hawking. Hawking. And the, those string theorists, you know. It's, uh... Yeah, because yeah, there's, yeah, there's no experiment that can be set up for it yet. At least not yet. Hopefully yeah. one day there will be. Okay, but it is, so it's, it's pretty tough, but I mean, do you get really stressed out before an exam? I've got to admit, I've never been an exam person. I, I never really liked studying for exams. I, I do much better at the research part where I get to ask my own questions and design my own experiments, which is, you know, as a scientist, is obviously the ultimate thing. So uh, I think you've just got to work hard for the bits you don't like. That's just what life is like. And then once you get to a certain point, enjoy it as much as you can. Okay. One last question. What is the most deadly virus to humans? I was going to suggest the 1914 flu virus, but is there something wilder than that? So Spanish flu was pretty bad. Uh, Rabies, I think, is still the most lethal virus. Okay. um, Because... It's really no one who has ever been infected with it has survived, as far as I know. But, of course, you're not likely to come across rabies. I would have said Ebola, um, but it it looks like Ebola is only really uh, lethal because most people who get it, unfortunately, are in places like Africa where the healthcare isn't very good. Uh, Everyone who's come back to, you know, Western places or places with better health care have done pretty well. So uh, I think flu viruses can be deadlier than you'd think. Um, but in terms of deadliest viruses, I, I, I assume we're probably yet to discover it potentially. Well, well, on that chilling note, dun dun dun. Thanks, Ross. No worries. Thanks, Maynard. Bloody buzzkill. <laughs> Reasonable is a podcast from the Merseyside Skeptic Society, hosted by Michael Marshall. In each monthly interview, we'll examine beliefs from outside of the mainstream, exploring how those views are constructed and what evidence people feel supports their case. 
On the latest issue, I speak with author and ESP researcher Ian Clark about his book, 426AM, and about his belief that humans can communicate via electrical signals. I've been told by various people before now, ah, Occam's razor, it was probably coincident. And all I can say is, no, really, I promise you, it's not a coincidence. Hear what Ian had to say, as well as finding back issues of the show, by searching merseysideskeptics.org.uk forward slash podcasts, are looking for Be Reasonable on iTunes. What we want is some more evidence, please. Here's Joe Alabaster. Hello, this is Joe Alabaster. Here is a press release from the Australian Skeptics. The Psychic Silly Season is here. More than 95% of Psychic's New Year predictions are wrong. The golden rule of Psychic predictions? Make a lot of them and crow loudly if a tiny percentage is right. Australian Skeptics match the predictors and challenge the wrongest profits in Australia. Put yourself up for the $100,000 challenge or shut up. Every year at about this time, Australia's psychic fraternity make their New Year's predictions for the coming year. And every year they get it mostly wrong. But they're never held to account, their homework is never marked, and they're simply back again in 12 months to make more wrong predictions. The best of them even publish their predictions in the Australian Psychic Directory, which is now called the International Psychic Directory for some reason. Richard Saunders, investigator with Australian Skeptics Inc., points out that, quote, We've been monitoring this panoply of psychic silliness for years, and by our calculations, only about 5% of predictions ever have any element of truth about what you get from simply guessing. And even most of these are either obvious, there'll be an earthquake somewhere in the world, or vague, there'll be an interesting developments in the relationship between Will and Kate. If they have one accurate hit on a specific prediction, it's probably more good luck than good judgment, but the psychic will dine out on that for the rest of their life, end quote, Saunders said. Quote, Some people say that these predictions are only for entertainment and shouldn't be taken too seriously, but these people charge money, often big money, for their services. If your mechanic or brain surgeon was right only 5% of the time, you'd probably look for a different mechanic or brain surgeon. If all mechanics or brain surgeons were right only 5% of the time, you'd probably start to doubt the whole industry. We've issued a challenge to any Australian psychic who can strut their stuff, and we're offering $100,000 to anyone who can prove their predictive skills. To date, no one has applied. Who would have predicted that? End quote. Anyway, never being people who show fear in the face of futility, this year Australian Skeptics has decided to join the throng and make our own incorrect, vague or obvious predictions. And one correct one. Here goes. Prediction 1. There will be an earthquake somewhere in the world. Reality. The U.S. National Earthquake Information Center estimates that several million earthquakes occur in the world each year. Many go undetected because they hit remote areas or have very small magnitudes. The average number of earthquakes of magnitude 5 and over for the last 100 years is 1,319 per annum. That's 3.6 every day. Prediction 2. There will be interesting developments in the relationship between Will and Kate. Reality? Really? Good or bad? Prediction 3. Malcolm Turnbull's popularity will decrease early in 2016 and that of Bill Shorten will increase, but not by as much. Reality. Well, who's not predicting this? My cat is predicting this and she's not very well. Prediction 4. There will be a federal election in the second half of 2016. Reality? Well, it has to be in 2016. And whether first half or second half is a 50-50 chance. But if prediction three is correct, then it's pretty much a certainty 
to be in the second half. Prediction 5. The 2016 budget will receive a lukewarm response. Reality? If predictions 3 and 4 are correct, then this will be a responsible pre-election budget, i.e. okay but not overly generous. Prediction 6. There will be a major ferry disaster in the Northern Hemisphere in 2016. Reality? There have been more than 50 maritime disasters with significant loss of life in the last 15 years. The vast majority of those were in the Northern Hemisphere. But psychics are notoriously geographically challenged. They'll claim any prediction anywhere and find some reason why they were close. Prediction 7. Brad and Angelina will break up and Angelina will retire from movie making. Reality? The break of Brangelina is predicted every year. But note that retire from movie making might mean her directing career rather than her acting. Prediction 8. John Howard, the actor, not the former PM, will be involved in a car accident in Victoria in May. He will be shaken but unhurt. Reality? A specific prediction. Yeah. Yeah. If it turns out to be true, we're made for life. But there are a few outs. It might actually turn out to be the XPM. It might be near Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania, ACT, see geographically challenged above. Or it might be June or April, temporally challenged as well. With psychics, near enough is close enough. Prediction 9. A much-loved member of the royal family will leave us in 2016, and there will be much sadness. Reality? Which royal family? Surely not Denmark. Japan? Leaves it wide open to post-facto claims of accuracy. Now, if you'd said the British royal family... Prediction 10. The vast majority of Australian psychics will get the vast majority of their predictions wrong. Reality? This is the accurate one. A guaranteed winner. And one for good measure, the open mic prediction. Reality, make up your own. It's just as likely to be correct as the professionals. Interested in keeping up with what's going on with Australian skeptics? Visit www.skeptics.com.au or check them out on Twitter at Ostskeptics. Want to help support the Skeptic Zone and look pretty damn stylish while you're about it? Visit Mr. Cat's Origami Jewelry. Go to www.skepticzone.tv and click the link, or simply Google Mr. Cat's Origami Jewelry, also on Facebook. Pendants, earrings, and cufflinks. Support Mr. Cat. Support the Skeptic Zone. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And aren't those anti-vaccination stories a bit of a worry? A bit of a worry. Thanks to those wonderful European people from the ESP podcast for having a chat to me. And thanks to Maynard Ross and Joe for also taking part in this week's episode. Coming up on The Skeptic Zone, even more from Maynard. Even more. There are still more interviews to come from Maynard from weeks and weeks and weeks ago when he was running around at the Australian Skeptics National Convention. Oh, the next national convention is going to be in, in Melbourne. Fantastic. Not exactly sure of the date yet, but stay tuned over the next few months. I'm sure we'll find that out. Oh, I do enjoy a Skeptics Convention in Melbourne. Ah, they always put on a, a really fine event. If you're a new skeptical group or you're having a skeptical event anywhere around the world and you want that to be uh, publicized, drop me a line. Just go to skepticzone.tv and click the contacts link. Let me know about it. Maybe we can organize to have it uh, appear on the show. 
But for this week, and there are not too many more weeks left in 2015, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for contacts, an archive of all episodes since 2008, and our online store. Please support the Skeptic Zone by following us on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, liking us on Facebook, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can also show your support by subscribing via PayPal for as little as 99 cents a week. The Skeptic Zone is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on The Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian Skeptics Inc. or any other skeptical organisation. Thank you.